Okay, here we are. So hi everyone, welcome to Code Pink's weekly webinar, What the F is Going On in Latin America. This is 20 minutes of hot news out of the Americas every Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern. And um, today I'm really pleased and excited and honored to have my friend, fellow activist and compatriot Dan Kavalik join us. Um, Dan is, uh, uh, teaches international human rights at the University of Pittsburgh. And also many of you listening may also know he's the author of, of a number of books, but relevant to today's conversation, he is the author of The Plot to Attack Iran, How the CIA and the Deep State Have, uh, have Conspired to Vilify Iran. And then your other book, yeah, I've read both of them, by the way, The Plot to Overthrow Venezuela, how the U.S. is orchestrating a coup for oil. And so, Dan, how fun to have you with us for this very, very topical conversation. Um, Thank you. I was in Venezuela when uh, the Iranian general was assassinated. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, it was pretty shocking um, for the entire world. And I'm happy to say there are no missiles flying between continents as we speak. But um, so maybe we could... Um, take this conversation, um, maybe give a little bit of history of the first US coup against um, Iran, 1953. We can talk about the similarities of that coup and what's um, been happening in Venezuela the last 20 years. And then maybe how this whole global vision of the United States is, is, a, is affecting these two countries and not just them, but those two as of uh, for this, for the sake of this conversation. The other thing I'd kind of like to throw in the mix, and I'm assuming you saw it, was this really crazy article in New York Post over the weekend that Iran could potentially use Venezuela as a tool to attack the United States. I don't know if you saw that, but, and, but that's not, and, and of course the president of Honduras um, made the statement over the weekend as well that he is an enemy of Iran and Hezbollah. So we can see how uh, things are overtly starting or could potentially align. So, so anyway, let's, um, let me have you take the conversation. So uh, if we start in 1953, this was the, well, it goes back, you know, even before then, we have to remember that uh, for most uh, of the uh, early part of the 20th century, Iran's oil was controlled by the British through a company called the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. Uh, but emphasis on the Anglo because uh, uh, Britain got nearly all the profits from Iran's oil. At the time, uh, by the time Mossadegh, Mohammad Mossadegh was elected prime minister in 1951, 90% uh, of Iran was living literally in rags um, while the British were siphoning uh, oil and money out of the country. And so Mohammad Mossadegh, a very popular politician, was elected prime minister. And the parliament of, of Iran um, supported him in nationalizing uh, British, uh, uh, what was Iranian oil. Uh, but nationalizing it and taking it from the British. And they were willing to pay compensation for it, by the way, though that number was never settled on what that would be. Though at one point, Mossadegh, who loved the Americans, by the way, much to his peril, uh, agreed that Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, uh, could be the arbiter of how much that compensation would be. Uh, but in any case, the British were furious by the nationalization, uh, made one run at, uh, at Truman before Eisenhower was elected to get him to help overthrow Mossadegh. And Truman refused. Truman said, I, you know, I have no interest in protecting British oil interest in Iran. Go home. You know. um, but then two things happened. Churchill was elected the new prime minister. He was reelected. Uh, as the Prime Minister of Great Britain, and then President Eisenhower was elected president. General Eisenhower was elected president in the U.S. So Churchill made another run at Eisenhower, and uh, through the Dulles brothers, we have to remember, both of which uh, had had uh, interest in uh, Anglo-Persian oil, by the way, 
Uh, John Dulles was the was Eisenhower's secretary of state. Allen uh, was the head of the CIA, the newly formed CIA. They convinced Eisenhower that somehow Iran was a communist threat, which was not true, um, and that Mossadegh had to be overthrown. And so they overthrew Mossadegh. It took a couple of years to do that, uh, but they did. And they used a lot of the same tactics, a lot of the same tactics they used in Iran. They continue to use in Iran to this day to try to overthrow uh, the current government there, but they also use them against other governments like the one in Venezuela. And so what does that look like? Back in the in 19, in the early 50s, what they did to Iran is they uh, they uh, actually blockaded Iran's oil, made it impossible for them to sell any oil uh, on the world market, and uh, they intentionally wrecked Iran's economy. They paid people to engage in violent street protests um, to undermine uh, Mossadegh's uh, popularity. Um, and, and this is how they orchestrated, in the end, a military coup against Mossadegh. Again, very much we see these things happening in Venezuela. We see these things happening in Iran. Both countries now are under very draconian sanctions by the United States, which are killing people. We know in Venezuela from this study, I'm sure you've cited many times by Jeffrey Sachs and Mark Weisbrot that about 40,000 Venezuelans died in a one-year period due to these sanctions. They expect more that was between uh, 2017, 2018. They expect more to die, uh, you know, in 2019 and, and into this year. Uh, and many people are dying in, in Iran as well because people are not getting food. They're not getting medicine due to these um, sanctions. At one point, um, you know, Trump threatened that Iran would not be able to sell one drop of oil. He has tried mightily to, uh, you know, back up that threat. He hasn't quite managed to do that, but that we have really damaged Iran's economy and we've damaged Venezuela's economy, uh, even, you know, by stealing, and let's face it, the U.S. stole uh, Citgo, uh, Venezuela's American-based oil company, uh, and their largest cash source of cash revenue. The U.S. stole it from them. Well, it's been really the whole movement against Venezuela has really been about reappropriating assets, financial assets and natural resource assets. And they're doing it short of a military. Yeah, yeah. It looks a lot like Iran in the early 50s. I mean, where, you know, Venezuela under Chavez uh, nationalized Venezuela's oil from companies like Exxon, Mobil, those companies want that oil back. And, you know, when uh, John Bolton was national security advisor, you know, he openly started meeting with Exxon and other companies and divvying up Venezuela's oil before they even had it back. You know, so it's pretty naked uh, theft, imperial theft uh, that's happening. Uh, you know, the latest move I saw today was that... Uh, Trump is imposing sanctions, not just against the Maduro government, but now against sectors of the opposition. Yes, the those opposition uh, people who were elected to the National Assembly on the 5th of January, correct? Right, because they voted out the U.S.'s puppet, Juan Guaido, right. as the head of the National Assembly. His being the head of the National Assembly was the only fig leaf the U.S. had for justifying recognizing him as president, even that was not real, you know, that was not constitutional, but it was at least a fig leaf, right? It gave some basis for saying, uh, you know, that, that, that the U.S. could recognize him. Now there's no fig leaf, you know, so uh, the Trump- Well, it's also an attempt, don't you think? It's also an attempt to prevent moderate, pra more pragmatic opposition members from um, creating dialogue and perhaps a peaceful solution between the elected government. Yeah, and and it's an overt attempt to prevent that from happening. Yeah, and we know that the U.S. has been doing that for some time. We know that, for example, uh, right before the 2018, is it 2018 re-election of Nicolas yeah. Maduro, yeah. Uh, the opposition and the government were just about to sign a comprehensive agreement in Santo Domingo. And literally... Uh, 
I believe it was Mike Pence who called and told the opposition, don't sign. They didn't want peace in Venezuela. They didn't want moderate opposition. Meanwhile, there was a moderate opposition candidate running against Maduro, Henry Falcone from the business community, who is a conservative, but he's not a radical conservative. I would say he's part of the loyal opposition. You know, he's not willing to burn Venezuela to the ground to get power, as some of these people are. He uh, was actually was, threatened to be sanctioned, wasn't he, for running? Yeah, for yeah. Trump threatened to sanction him if he ran for president against Maduro. Because, again, uh, two things they felt threatened by. One, having a moderate opposition person in power, who, again, uh, might not carry out all of the U.S.'s uh, wishes in Venezuela. But also, they wanted to totally delegitimize the election. If Maduro ran unopposed, of course, they could say, oh, you know, this is democracy, you know, Soviet style or Hussein, you know, Saddam Hussein style or something. Uh, to have a candidate actually run against him and lose was not what the U.S. wanted. So, yes, they threatened to sanction um, him. And by the way, his economic advisor, Francisco, I think, Rodriguez, is that right? Yeah, Francisco Rodriguez, yeah. Uh, he has come out against U.S. sanctions on Venezuela, and he has said that they could permanently destroy Venezuela's economy. Um, and again, that is an inconvenient statement uh, by him. And many members of the opposition, of course, again, the loyal opposition, are opposed to sanctions because they know it's wrecking uh, their country. And again, possibly irreparably, and they don't want to see that. You know, it's the people, the real uh, radical right wing who don't care about that because they can always live in Miami or whatever. Um, and those they already are, do. Yeah, and they already do. And that's who the U.S. is aligning with, are those radical uh, sectors of the opposition. In both countries. In both Wealthy countries. business class in both countries. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the, the actual working relationship between Iran and Venezuela. They've been trade partners for many years. This is nothing new. Uh, and so nothing for US uh, civilians to be fearful of. This is a, a, a south, global south to south trading relationship that's, that has existed for many years. And it, it stemmed from, from then Hugo, President Hugo Chavez's vision of, of a multilateral uh, trade situation, uh, particularly the global south, but for the planet in general, which is completely antithetical to this unilateral vision that the United States has been promoting for, I would argue, for at least 40 years. Yes, yeah, so um, Iran and Venezuela are very close allies, which makes a lot of sense. Again, both are very uh, important oil producers. Um, both have been under the gun of the United States for a long time. Both are members of the non-aligned movement, by the way. And, and in fact, uh, Venezuela and Iran over the years have essentially rotated as the heads of the non-aligned movement. Chavez was the, head, was the head for a while, was the president of the non-aligned movement. Uh, I believe Ahmadinejad was, um, and then Maduro was, and then... Um, the current uh, uh, prime minister of, 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 of Iran it was, I don't, honestly, they just had elections and I forget who's the head of it now, but point is they've been very important uh, actors in the non-aligned movement, which is, goes back to the 1960s, which was a movement of mostly third world countries um, who wanted to get out of uh, not only Western hegemony, but also wanted some independence from the Soviet Union and China as well. So Iran and Venezuela have this nat natural kindred relationship and Iran has been trying to help Venezuela through this period, uh, particularly by helping get it medicine, for example, and other resources that it can't get due to these sanctions. Now, of course, now that Iran's under tighter sanctions, that's gonna be harder for them to do, but Iran has learned over uh, the 40 years of its revolution, uh, which has meant 40 years of sanctions, um, to become largely self-sufficient. 
You know, they make almost everything they use, including their own nail. You know, um, and they had to help Venezuela make that adjustment and to become more uh, independent as well. So um, there's a lot of, of uh, kindred feelings between those two countries. And it's interesting, of course, because Iran's an interesting country. The government's an interesting amalgam of things because, of course, it is Islamic. You know, we know that it's, it's, it's a theocracy, though it does have democratic aspects, a, a democratically elected parliament, a democratically elected president. I misspoke. I said prime minister, it's a president. Um, but ultimately, you have the Ayatollah, who is the supreme leader. Um, so you have this uh, theocratic government, but you also have socialist aspects of that system uh, as well. So it's a bit of an amalgam, and it seems like Iran and Venezuela are able to kind of get over what seem to be some natural differences uh, in that regard. So let me, um, I know, you know, you and I have done a lot of solidarity work in Venezuela and and. And of course, their um, solidarity work with Iran intersects quite often for both of yeah. us. And um, you mentioned uh, pharmaceuticals and developing more domestic, the Iranians helping the Venezuelans uh, develop more uh, domestic industry. I believe pharmaceuticals is one of the projects the Iranians yes. are helping with. And I would also like to just share with the audience, and you too, I guess, because you know, I was in Venezuela for two weeks the end of December. I went for the holidays, and you and I haven't talked since I came back, actually. But um, I have to say the holiday season in Venezuela was one of the most vibrant socially and economically that I've seen in, in a number of years. And I think you would have been very pleased to have been there to see it. Um, there is more and more food products being produced domestically. And that was very clear in the stores uh, earlier in 19, 2019 as well, but really very overt for the holidays. And this introduction and really overt use of their cryptocurrency for holiday purchasing, the Petro. And the Iranians are big supporters of cryptocurrency as well, correct? Yes. Yes, indeed. And I, I do want to, you know, also, you know, just chime in that, yeah, it looks like things in Venezuela are improving. The oil production is up the highest it's been in years. Um, its economy expe is expected to grow this year. So things are really moving, it seems, forward, which, of course, is making the U.S. much more desperate. Um, and, and so the U.S., you know, wants to hurt Iran, uh, not just to hurt Iran, but also to prevent them from helping, of course, uh, Venezuela. And you see that, that the U.S. is trying to interfere in this th sort of uh, third world solidarity trying to interrupt Cuba's medical missions throughout the world, for example, which really threatened U.S. hegemony. So um, again, yeah, things are looking up in Venezuela. And so expect more trouble from the United States. So Dan, you've been so gracious to give us 20 minutes of your time this, this afternoon. Is there anything in that we should specifically mention? Before I let you go, I should also ask you to see if we have a few questions. Um, is there anything that we should emphasize? Well, I mean, I think the main thing is that we need to be vigilant. We need to continue to support Venezuela, continue to support Iran, continue to support Cuba, Nicaragua, Bolivia uh, in resisting U.S. aggression. I mean, that's really our duty, I think, as Americans. Um, both of us have been to Venezuela have seen the process there, have seen that it is not this dictatorship we've been led to believe it is. Uh, I've, I've been in Iran once in 2017. I mean, that's an amazing country. It's not perfect. Uh, by the way, neither is our country. <laughs> um, uh, you know, but okay. they tried to, <laughs> to make strides in terms of women's rights, in terms of other rights. Let's say, you know, comparing apples to apples, I'd rather live in Tehran than in Saudi Arabia, for example, which the U.S. Which we never discuss. Yeah, we never U.S. discuss that candidly regarding yeah. U.S. foreign policy. You know, there's one thing I'm just looking at my notes um, looking at something that we that you brought up 
<clears throat> early on in our conversation. And that was about uh, the Eisenhower administration. And this was in the early 50s, um, not agreeing or not setting a, a, a price for Iranian oil. I don't know exactly what you said, but it made me think of what happened with the Cuban sugar in the early 50s um, with the same administration. And when the Cubans had nationalized uh, business, US businesses and had offered to pay fair market price for those businesses and would sell Cuban sugar to raise that money. And then the US government said, you can't sell Cuban sugar in the United States any longer. So is it the same sort of thing that they did to the Iranian oil in the, in the same era, within the same years? Yeah, well, very similar, oh. yeah. In the case of, yeah, Iran, they just, they literally, Britain set up a naval blockade uh, in the Persian Gulf, literally did not allow Iran to, to sell any oil, which also showed an important thing, by the way, which I think we could probably conclude on. A lot of times people think that these wars against Venezuela and Iran are for access to oil. But it showed, for example, during the blockade of Iran, we didn't need their oil, right? We don't need oil now. The US exports oil and natural gas now. We're a net exporter of fossil fuels. We don't need access to it. The US wants control over it. One, because it's important geopolitically, and two, they want control so their companies profit from it. And so it's not about access, it's about control, which is a point Noam Chomsky has made time and again. It's about control of the oil and is it about control of the oil to control the global currency and have the global currency remain the US petrodollar? So yeah, well that's, that, that's part together. of it as well, to be able to control the pricing, all that, right. And the US is afraid if they have, you know, frankly, competitors. It really is kind of, it's, it's like an old style mafia mentality. <laughs> but, you know, right, you go and you knock right. off the business owner, there's a the little shopkeeper, right, who isn't paying right. your, your tribute, right? This right. is exactly it. Just on a global but, scale, yeah. Controls the world. <laughs> but if there's one little guy out there who's not paying tribute, He's got to be knocked out. It sets a bad example. I mean, that's what this is about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The total, the total um, U.S. financial and corporate um, yeah. control, the unilateral control uh, of the global currency and global trade, and that is precisely what Iran and Venezuela um, have sought an alternative for for many, many years. So, okay, Dan, I want to thank you again for joining thank us. You. Really you, great talking to you this afternoon. And um, so folks, you can join us next Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern um, for another 20 minutes of hot news out of Latin America on Code Pink's What the F is Going On in Latin America. Thanks again, Dan. Really appreciate thank your you. time. Good Take to talk care. to you. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.